Okay, everybody, welcome to the latest edition of the ESO Comms Network webinar series. Today we are talking about rare genetic obesities. Uh, so welcome, thank you for joining, and please remember that the uh, video recording and any relevant materials and slides will be shared with you after the session. Please also remember to mute if you are not speaking, uh, but you can ask questions um, orally or in the chat when the time comes. We'll have a Q&A session after the presentations. So there's not much more for me to say because this is a recurring webinar. We all know each other quite well, I think now. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to my great colleague, Katie Mitchell, who is going to introduce the uh, esteemed faculty for you. So thank you very much for joining and enjoy an excellent webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Ewan. And just to make sure I keep in uh, Sheree's good books, can I just uh, mention the hashtag EASOCOM? So if anybody's talking about the sessions, um, please use that that has the hashtag. I've put the details in the chat um, and just connect with EA Service team when you're doing that as well, please. Um, so we have three fantastic speakers um, today. We're going to start with um, Erica and Elizabeth. Now, I have um, a very detailed bio from both, which I'm going to put in the chat, um, but I'll just keep my introduction brief so that we can get on with the uh, far more interesting section of the webinar with their talk. Um, so, uh, but Erica is a paediatric uh, endocrinologist and associate professor. She is head of um, the division and a lecturer based in Rotterdam. She's the co-founder of the Obesity Clinic CGG um, together with Lisbeth, which is an EASO um, center of management and a national referral center specializing in children and adults with obesity. And, and Lisbeth is an endocrinologist and professor in the field of obesity, also based in the Netherlands. Um, she obtained an MD and PhD and performed an obesity research fellowship over in Baltimore in the USA. She's contributed to the National Prevention Agreement and in 2020 and 2021 was appointed um, as top 10 most influential women in the healthcare in the Netherlands, which is fantastic. <laughs> Um, so I will pass the floor to both of you. And like I said, I'll drop the more detailed bios in the chat so people can read those at their convenience. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Katie, for giving us the opportunity to present here today. And I will do no further introduction of ourselves because you, I cannot do better than you did. But um, we will, uh, Lisbeth and I have uh, founded and, and are coordinating this center together. So we will also do this presentation really together. And, uh, and so I will start today, uh, if that's okay. Lisbeth? Yes, hi, nice seeing you all. I will start to share the slides. So Erica will start off with the presentation and I will do a, show some slide next. Great. Yes, here we are. So um, this was the introduction and we'll go to the next slide, which will show our uh, disclosures. These are my disclosures. These are the ones of Lisbeth. And uh, just before we start a little bit about our center, we are located in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and we, our center focuses on, yeah, it has a broad focus on children and adults with obesity. And we aim to do uh, diagnostics of underlying causes. That will be especially the subject of today, but also focus in care and research on personalized and innovative treatments, research and education. Least, uh, yeah, and, we, and it's important to say because today is focusing on part of what we do, the genetic obesity part, and we do that. We are a national center of expertise together with the Department of Clinical Genetics in Amsterdam, Mieke van Haalst, and we are the center of expertise on genetic obesity. Next, please. Lisbeth. Yes, so this will be what we will be discussing today. We will talk shortly about some weight regulation, then discuss the clinical phenotype of rare genetic uh, obesity disorders, mm -hmm. talk about the prevalence, and then who should we test for genetic obesity. So first of all, there are many causes of obesity, as you quite well know, and as all being obesity experts. 
Um, category one to four is very prevalent. So lifestyle induced obesity, mental uh, factors contributing to obesity, medication induced obesity and endocrine factors or diseases. They're all very prevalent and very often it's, it's a combination with uh, lifestyle and category two, three and four. But category five, hypothalamic, and six, monogenic and syndromic obesity, or six is together genetic obesity, is more rare. And that's the focus of today, category six, so the genetic uh, obesity. So um, what, what's important here? We first have to, to, to start up with some, some regulation. How is our weight and our appetite being regulate, regulated before talking about the genetics? Because these are the, 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 the factors which are being disturbed in genetic obesity. So when looking at our appetite, for example, we have many systems influencing it. So of course, our cognitive function, our ratio, we can say, well, I want to eat healthy. That's very important. It's an important factor. But many other uh, food decisions are based on, for example, the homeostatic and hedonic system, and sometimes also on the brainstem reflex. So when we also look to the weight regulation, we know that if, if you have a certain amount of fat mass, this fat mass is an active organ that produces the very important fat hormone, the adipokine leptin, and this signals to the brain, to the hypothalamus, um, and, and tells basically the brain how much fat is in the body. It's like a weight scale for, for fat mass. And normally, if you have a normal healthy weight, uh, we, this the signals being received by the leptin receptor and automatically due to the hypothalamus there's a reduced food intake so to decrease of hung feelings of hung hunger and your metabolism is being increased so normally you have a perfect balance in the amount of fat mass and how your brain is being stimulated or inhibited but if there's obesity we know there's more leptin and uh, this leptin is because there's more fat mass but we know that in the hypothalamus, there's also pro-inflammation there, like is in the visceral fat. And the whole signal of, of too much leptin is not being sensed very well. So sort of leptin resistance, there's a lot of discussion whether it's really resistance, but there is a compensatory higher level of, of leptin. But the whole negative feedback system on reducing the food intake is, is being disturbed. And that we know that uh, that that is progressive and this whole system this disturbance can cause further weight gain so as you all very well know uh, know is obesity is a chronic relapsing disease so when we go to the system and we look at the homeostatic system this is part of the homeostatic system so the amount of fat in your body in the leptin but also your intestines are very important endocrine organs regulating your body weight and your appetite for example, if you start eating or you see some food, you start making more ghrelin, the hunger, hunger hormone. And after about 20 minutes, you start producing all kinds of intestinal hormones like GLP-1, PYY, CCK, and they all signal to the hypothalamus and uh, decrease uh, um, hunger. So they increase the feelings of fullness, they increase satiety. Um, but still, sometimes if you have this homeostatic system working perfectly well and you feel very full you can still eat through it and that's mostly the case when you look for example like something really delicious like a dessert and if you eat a dessert it creates a feelings of comfort and this is mainly due to the hedonic system um like uh, being um related to dopamine serotonin and endocannabinoid factors of course and it just gives you feelings of comfort um and in these times, we mostly eat on our hedonic system and not so much on our homeostatic system. So this is when we look around us, we all see the delicious things. Our body starts to re respond with our hedonic system and we take the chocolate, although we don't, we know the chocolate is not the optimal food for us. Uh, so the hedonic system is also very important. Now, basically, in, in obesity, you have not only disturbance of your leptin system, but also disturbed hormonal communication between fat, other organs, the intestines, and the brain. And you tend to further gain weight. So now we will start off with a case Erica will show, uh, which is with a defect in one of these systems. Please, Erica. Yes, we would, because you're all involved in, in uh, centers of obesity management, 
we thought we will make this more tangible by presenting this clinical case. Uh, and before I start, in the end, my question will be, what is the diagnosis, the underlying cause in this case of the obesity? So this boy was born uh, in a Dutch family, a Dutch farmer's family, and his birth was uneventful. He was um, had a normal weight and height at birth. Next slide, please. But very soon, in the first months after birth, parents noticed that this child was crying all the time, uh, excessively crying infant. And they noticed that the only time he was not crying is when he was being fed, uh, bottle fed. So it, it looked like he had no satiety. He had a normal development. He was otherwise healthy. Uh, but, and we look back in the photograph book, uh, his mother says he's everywhere, he's always eating, he's always asking for food, that's hunger. Um, his weight soon uh, moved completely out of range, his height was relatively tall, and at the community centers the, the healthcare professional said this is not going well, he's eating way too much, and his parents said you're right, but how to... How, how can we change this? He's, he's, he's uh, asking for food all the time. Next slide, please. And there's one more sign that's important in this case is that he was different than the rest of his family. Here he is with his sister. Uh, and, and this was about the age that they put locks on all the doors in the kitchen uh, because else uh, this boy would uh, start uh, stealing food uh, out of it. Next slide, please. And the, the, the last sign I, and symptom I want to share with you is that at night, uh, as soon as he got old enough, he climbed out of bed and ate even frozen chicken from, from the fridge or apples with plastic uh, on it, still on it, the plastic wrappers. So the question is, what diagnosis did you make of this patient? Next slide, please. I will... And um, I will I will show you. It was in this case it was a defect in a gene which is involved in functioning of the leptin melanocortin pathway, which is located in the hypothalamus. So he had an MC4R gene defect, which means that the hypothalamus it was not um, sensing uh, satiety. And uh, he was always hungry and his weight increased immensely. Next slide, please. It, we feel it is really important to diagnose these patients. Uh, why? First of all, because they need tailored supportive care. It just works different in these patients than in other patients. But the other thing is that uh, there, is, uh, there are real new pharmacotherapeutic possibilities. And we will uh, mention more about that later on in the presentation of today. What kind of pharmacotherapy is possible? Because I will focus on how to diagnose the, these patients. Next slide, please. Well, there are two main uh, or several main clinical characteristics uh, that are hallmarks of this disease in children. First of all, the early onset, severe obesity in the early years of life, and second of all, the uh, phenotype of hyperphagia. Next slide, please. The, the first sign, early onset severe obesity, here you can see in, in the right slide that especially in specific diagnosis of rare genetic obesity disorders in the leptin melanocortin pathway, the weight is already uh, way increased in, in the first, immediately after birth, it starts increasing and it is immense in the first years of life. So the weight trajectory and the graph is really important. Next slide, please. The other sign is the hyperphagia. Um, and I want to mention here that hyperphagia is really something different than um, then occasional overeating, then the hedonic overeating, then binge eating. This is really the most upper level of 
having hunger that we know about. So um, how do how do we diagnose hyperphagia? That no, so, sorry, one one uh, one slide back still. Because how do you ask for that in your in your uh, outpatient clinic? How do you diagnose this? There is not a validated tool for this yet. So what we do is currently is use questionnaires on eating behavior. For example, the external eating behavior score is, is one that is usually very high in these patients. And the other thing is that there are five questions that you can ask uh, to patients to have an indication on this. The first is on satiation, which means uh, what happens during a meal. It, it makes you stop eating. Does somebody has satiety? which is after the meal, does somebody know when it's full? Does somebody feel fullness and for how long? The third is the hunger. How immense is the hunger that people feel? So on a score of one to 10, these people often uh, um, experience a score of 10 uh, in hunger. The fourth is binge eating. And the fifth is nocturnal eating. So these are all signs that you saw in this boy. Next slide, please. It's also important to mention that it can be a little bit different in adults. And, and Lisbeth will, will uh, go on uh, on the subject of adults in a minute. But I want to say that the early onset severe obesity, while in children it's usually below the age of five, in adults it is much more maybe even below the age of 10, or the, the onset can be a little bit later. And the same is for hyperphagia, it is less. Uh, yeah, well discriminative from other eating disorder, uh, disorders. So that's that's important to keep in mind for adults. And uh, and the next thing uh, to to take into account in your uh, clinic is uh, to record a good family history. So genetic obesity can either be autosomal dominant or it can be recessive. And then in the last case, the patient is really different from from the other family members. And last but not least, we have patients who have a very, uh, who are very uh, therapy resistant. And then it's also a sign to think of genetic obesity. Next slide, please. So this is not a slide to read. It's just that I want to, you to know where to find the information when to, you want to look it up again because we are talking about rare diseases, but uh, in our clinics, we do find uh, quite a lot of underlying causes when you look in the right group. So for example, as we, we have described that in, in very much detail, how we do the diagnostic pathway in patients with, for example, early onset severe obesity in children, and then we do a very detailed screening which includes questionnaires and lab tests and genetic testing. Uh, but if you do it like that, your yield can be really high. So we found uh, an underlying cause in almost one in five patients in this group, of which 13% had a genetic, really a hardcore genetic defect. So, so if uh, so, it it might be nice to compare how you you screen these patients to how we do it. And this article also shows a nice table of what kind of genetic defects we found and what their phenotype was. Next slide, please. So, um, how rare is it actually? Well, um, most of these diagnoses are rare to ultra rare, but we still, even if they are rare, they are still underdiagnosed. Under How do we know that? Well, we know that because you can estimate the prevalence based on genetic uh, databases and on literature report, reports. You can estimate how much individuals you would expect that, uh, that are present in, our, in, in Europe, for example. And we did it, for example, for the leptin receptor uh, deficient patients. And, and uh, we found that there should be around a thousand individuals in Europe at minimum. And if we screen literature, only 86 are reported until now. 
So we, we know that, it, that there are still a lot of patients around there not being diagnosed or, or not reported, of course. Next slide, please. And, um, uh, uh, and again, um, uh, so the question is, in which group will you screen? And we, we, uh, I've been talking about which is the high risk group. Eh? Uh, we are talking about uh, children with early onset severe obesity. Eh? This, uh, for example, before the age of four. That is a really large group worldwide. I was amazed to see these figures in this article that, that, that between six and 7% of the children worldwide already have an early onset severe obesity. And uh, so if, uh, if you look at papers that screened in this phenotype on their obesity clinic, which is of course a different group than in the first article, I recognize that there's a bias in this because these are the patients visiting your clinic. But then you can have a yield of between five and 13% of a genetic diagnosis. So it's worthwhile looking for it. Next, please. And it's not only in the children to, that we should look for it. Uh, we should also look in adults, uh, for example, uh, people with uh, therapy resistance or in a group of bariatric surgery, we found that the percentages are quite substantial and worthwhile. Next slide, please. I'm almost, um, yeah. Uh, this microphone, yeah, thanks. Um, so if you're, by this time you're thinking, yeah, what kind of gene genetic testing should we do? Well, there are of course already many gene panels now available. This is just an example of the one that we use. We use a gene panel, you can find it on the website that has been developed by Mieke van Aalst in Amsterdam. And, um, but there's something that you should take into account. These gene panels, you always only find part of the defects, especially the monogenic defects, especially the non-syndromic defects, and the ones that, that, uh, that have a single variant. But they do not find syndromes, for example, which are caused by a uniparental disomy or, uh, or by methylation problems. So for that, you always need to think of, do we need to do specific additional tests like an array or a VES or a methylation studies? Next slide, please. And these slides are not for reading now. Again, you can look them up again when you want to look it back. But I just want to mention, show here that um, uh, to, di to, to diagnose these specific uh, syndromes or, or defects, there are um, features that are overlapping, like, for example, the early onset obesity or the hyperphagia. But there are also specific features that you can look for. For example, the MC4 patients are relatively tall, but some syndromes like Alstom syndromes, they have short stature. So you can, and, and, and other endocrine abnormalities like hypogonadism are sometimes present in specific um, defects. Next slide, please. And um, especially in syndromes, you can often uh, see that there is intellectual disability. Um, or cognitive impairment. So that should make you think of, could there be a syndromic form of genetic obesity here? Next slide. And this is the summary of that, which you can keep in mind and you can try to remember by head. So the genetic obesity, you can divide them in two major uh, um, groups. One is the non-syndromal, the, the, like the case I showed you, eh, which are relatively health, otherwise actually completely healthy children. They, they accept for their severe early onset obesity and hyperphagia, sometimes endocrine disorders. The other group is more often has many more features, like um, their eating behavior can really be abnormal or other congenital disorders or short stature. Next slide, please. And therefore, as a pediatrician, I cannot stress enough the importance of the growth chart in this, because 
On the left, you see this chart of typically of a, a monogenic form, non-syndromal genetic obesity, uh, and the weight already excessively increasing from birth onwards. And on the right, the syndromal form, which sometimes takes a little while, can even have feeding problems in, at start, and then uh, start to increase immensely with a short stature at the same time. So that re should really be a red light for the, uh, for the syndromic form. And the same is interesting for the, uh, their eating behavior. Uh, uh, it is nice to be curious about what happens exactly with their eating behavior. The non-syndromal form is really the, the, the hardcore hyperphagia, while in the syndromal form, it's much more often more complex in their behavior. There can be ag aggressive behavior, depressive uh, signs, or um, autistic features. So it's more often um, complex. Next slide, please. And now, um, now we'll switch to another case. And with this in mind, it should not be difficult for you to diagnose the next case. Lisbeth. Yes, thank you, Erica. Yes, this is a case uh, of a male. He came to our adult uh, outpatient clinic of our obesity center, CCG, in Rotterdam. He was 30 years old and he had a history of uh, weight gain around 11 years old. He had hyperphagia and his type of hyperphagia was related to abnormal eating. So when he was really young, he was eating like his mother told, uh, he was eating crafts, which were meant to, to give to birds. And he was eating all the, those, those kind of things. When he was adult, he had a more classical hyperphagia. So he didn't feel any satiety or satiation. So uh, he was always hungry. Also very typical, he had a delayed speech development and also an autism spectrum disorder, which is more prevalent indeed in syndromal uh, genetic obesity. Also, he, had, he suffered from a psychosis during puberty um, and was treated with antipsychotic uh, medication and he further very much increased in weight. So at the time he was 15, he was uh, having living with obesity. Um, so as an adult, his BMI was 33, he was doing a lot on, on his lifestyle, uh, trying to live healthy. He had some uh, lab abnormalities, also very typical was a mild hypogonadism, which can of course be due to any obesity, but also specifically in syndromic obesity, you sometimes see the even more uh, uh, lower uh, uh, testosterone. So what we, we do, we, first of all, we, we of course t did genetic testing and he had a 16P deletion, deletion syndrome, which is one of the relatively more prevalent syndromes. Um, and then what do you do? Well, he was not uh, eligible for, for any, any study. Karine Clement will show some clinical studies. We were also uh, collaborating there in Rotterdam on, on the set melanotide. He was not eligible. Um, what we do have, uh, we have obesity treatments in the Netherlands and uh, of course lifestyle treatments and also pharmacotherapy are the basis uh, and next to baric surgery, but baric surgery is in, in uh, monogenic obesity, not the, the preferred therapy because there's some limited literature showing now that the response may be l less than average and pharmacotherapy you can stop and, and start and stop if it's not effective. So what we did in this patient is sort of specialized uh, uh, combined lifestyle intervention, specifically for patients with autism. Um, and he lost substantial weight. And then when he plateaued the weight, we added liraglutide uh, three milligram. Um, so what's the result? You can see it here actually. Uh, he started already to lose weight with this specific combined lifestyle uh, program, really 27 kilograms and then an additional uh, eight and a half kilograms with uh, lira glutide addition. And he actually normalized his, his uh, BMI and he's still on, on treatment on pharmacotherapy and very much struggling with, with lifestyle still. Um, we did another uh, uh, case series also of two, in, in total two 16P deletion syndrome and also two MC4 receptor mutation patients. And as you can see here in patients one and two, there are 16 p deletion patients. You see that with GLP-1, 
uh, treatment that that weight is decreasing and it's uh, in these cases it was de decreased for a substantial time so here 40 weeks here even there was another GLP-1 analog more than uh, 10 years but also the MC4 receptor heterozygous we, we had in our, uh, our patient clinic also for a substantial time they had a um, uh, weight loss which was um, uh, more than uh, 15 kilograms um, well, it, it, to be honest, it's not in every patient it's successful. Sometimes we have patients it's not successful. Here we compared a very small group, this very preliminary data, but to, just to give you an idea of our clinical experience, that when you compare for, with respect to weight loss, the non-genetic and the monogenic, for example, and the syndromic, that you see that on average the, the weight loss is not so very different. Uh, please realize that the numbers are very low, and also this is a combination of liraglutide, but also the natrexone bupropion. Um, so you see that uh, at, at around four months, that the weight loss is around five percent, which is already great because these people with uh, uh, people with uh, monogenic obesity or syndromic obesity are very progressive in their weight gain usually. So stabilizing weight is already very good, but uh, 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 decreasing weight is even better. And most important is for these patients, what we, what we hear from them is decreasing their hyperphagia. They are getting big, big their lives. Um, we had both stories we heard from our patients with um, treating with liraglutide, that their, their homeostatic system, uh, their, their satiety was in, in improved, but also, uh, Notrix on Bipropion. And during the, the ECO, also Mila Welling will show a, a beautiful case who had a, an a MC4 uh, receptor mutation, already had gastric bypass, had already lifestyle uh, interventions and liraglutide and still no weight loss. But then treating with Notrix on Bipropion, she lost uh, 38 kilograms, so about 20% weight loss. And again, this is not for every patient. You see that, that some here, you see a lot of variation that some increased weight even and some decreased weight. I think the advantage of pharmacotherapy is that you can uh, stop it again. If it's not effective, just stop it. And if it's effective, then you can continue. So we are sort of, um, it's trial and error and, and, and trying and, and I'm happy to share also with you the experience and I'm very looking forward to your experience to, to hear. Um, so I think this is a completely new field and so this is not the targeted therapy and Karim will speak about the targeted therapy which is also a beautiful new way for these uh, uh, patients. So um, to conclude, who should we test genetically? Well, it should be considered in individuals with an early onset obesity and hyperphagia. And in addition, also an alarm symptoms is if there is a family history of either severe obesity and or a striking weight difference with family members. So a person who's the only one in the family, that's very suspicious. Um, or one parent is obese and, 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 and the siblings are of normal weight and the patient is living with obesity. Um, so there are many other alarm symptoms Erica already discussed. So it's good to keep in mind that, for example, autism, de developmental delay also is, is, uh, is, is maybe pointing more to a syndromic obesity. Uh, to stature more to monogenic obesity. So there are specific alarm symptoms to, to know where to look for. So to end, why is it important? Well, genetic obesity classically uh, presents with early obesity uh, and hyperphagia, and it's very heterogeneous group. Um, you can divide it in non-syndromic and syndromic obesity. And for these patients, it's really a severe situation, very disabling. Um, we always say it's rare. Maybe some uh, phenotypes and, and genotypes are extremely rare, but some are also underdiagnosed and actually if, if we know that many patients are underdiagnosed we should be aware especially when you're working in a specialized obesity center they are uh, there so diagnosis is important also for the stigma they eat a lot because they're hyperphagic for example but also for personalized treatments and clinical trials so to end, I would like to thank the whole researcher team and also the clinical team um, of the Obesity Center CGG. And thank you for your attention.
Um, let me see whether there are any questions. Thank you very much both. Yeah, there's one um, in the chat there, Elizabeth, from Arena. I don't know whether you or Erica would prefer to answer. Um, the first question was, how do you define severe obesity? Oh, yes, uh, I can do that. Um, so in adults, everybody knows the different cutoff levels, like above BMI above 25 is overweight, above 30 is obesity, above 35 is, is uh, obesity grade uh, grade two and above 40 is obesity grade three and you, you have those um, age and sex specific cutoffs for children as well so severe obesity means uh, BMI uh, in the category of obesity grade three yes and maybe good to this a question about this it was a BMI of only 33 um, the, the thing uh, for me to, to test him was the, the, the speech developmental delay, the autism. Also, if sometimes there are very subtle dysmorphic features and a combination with a relatively early onset. And maybe it's good to be aware that the syndromic, there's a difference in, in making the diagnosis when people are um, adult when they present or when they're children when they present. Because when they're children, it seems to be you need to be more strict in, in the age of onset, should be very young. But now looking at the generation, if people are 50 or 60, but they report to be uh, living with obesity when they were uh, seven, or 10, it's, it, well, they were quite unique in those times. They, 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 obesity was not so prevalent as now. And then if you have a combination with other alarm symptoms, um, then it, it can still make you uh, uh, do the genetic uh, testing. So it's a combination of early onset obesity, hyperphagia, only one in the family, and uh, other alarm symptoms, uh, which are listed and also in, in the article of the diagnostic workup we, we, we wrote, you can look it back in the, t in the table. Um, so I think that's, that's an important thing that the diagnosis, the age of the generation effect is important. And for syndromic obesity, it's more around it also some of our patients, they developed obesity uh, around puberty and monogenic, we found often more uh, uh, seven or lower of, of age. Um, and in this specific patients, also when people compensate a lot, if they uh, are exercising every day and they're trying to limit their food intake despite their hyperphagia, but they're still having a, a BMI of 33, including alarm symptoms, that, that, that is making us testing it. So BMI itself is not a good cutoff. It, there can be very well a lifestyle induced obesity uh, and having an, an, an BMI of, of 40, 45, for example. And let's see also the optimal patient profile for the use of mysimba. Yeah, we use it specifically when patients, for example, are uh, uh, having the craving. So they, 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 are, they had dinner, but they're still craving afterwards. I think that, that this profile is, is sometimes very well responding for the naltrexone, bipropion, the mysimba. <clears throat> okay, lovely. Thank you. Are there any further questions um, at the moment or would we prefer to move on? Um, there will be time at the end as well, but if anybody does have any questions, you can either raise your hand or pop them yes. in the chat there. I see more questions, but I think uh, because of time, let's first do Karim and then we can come back to that uh, at the end. Okay. Lovely. So I'll just do a quick introduction of Kareen and then as before, I'll put the bio in the chat so you can read that at your own time. Um, but Kareen is MD, PhD, medical doctor and a professor in nutrition based in Paris. Um, her and her group have contributed to more than 400 highly cited publications and she has re received several national and international prizes and contributed to several scientific advisory boards and international consortia. Um, so Karine, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Cathy. Um, okay, so I share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Is that okay? Yes, very well. Perfect. Okay, very well. Thank you. So hi everyone. So so um, so thanks for uh, to to EA so for this uh, very kind invitation. So I, I think um, our presentation um, well we, we make complementary presentation. I will I will focus on the role of pharmacotherapy in, in genetic obesity. So here are my disclosures. And so have we 
heard in the first part of the of the session, um, we, we spoke about uh, all these uh, key medical questions regarding the diagnosis of rare form of severe obesity. And uh, we had discussion together with Erika and, and um, Lisbeth about obesity management uh, in this patient with uh, basically monogenic uh, form of obesity or syndromic of obesity. And you understood that there are ma ma major issues, um, which are, of course, the control of hyperphagia and or weight gain. And it, something very important was said about the, the importance of the control of hyperphagia, because that's a major fact factors and patients are suffering of this severe hyperphagia. And we understood also that uh, uh, obesity management in this patient uh, is as multifaceted uh, aspects with, uh, of course, the, the role of uh, taking care of endocrine dysfunction, behavior, comorbidities, and, and there is also an important role of caregivers. Uh, I will come back uh, telling you some words about bariatric surgery, but my focus today is really to speak about uh, the new approach and basically new pharmaceutical therapy. And, and now there has been great progress in, in, in this field. So I will start uh, again by, by a clinical case. And uh, this is a, a young person. Her first name is, is Sarah, and I met her when she was 13. And as you can see on, on, on this part here, so, so you recognize what uh, Erika has told you is a very rapid increase in, in body mass index from birth. And, and what you, you have here, the first two uh, body, my, body mass index curve are patients with leptin receptor deficiency. And, and with, uh, on the, with the squares here, this is uh, the, the, the chart from, from Sarah. And, and you, you will immediately recognize the very rapid increase in body mass index and, of course, weight. And, and it's like a, a patient with a, a leptin receptor variant. And, and here you have one patient with melanocortin for receptor. But in that case, he's has a, a, he has a homozygous mutation for MC4R. And here, that patient with heterozygous variants in the melanocortin for receptor. And then when you look at also the, the Sarah's skin and, and you look at the family here, so that's a big family uh, with, with actually uh, nine uh, children. And, and you look at her skin, she's quite pale. And, and also, I don't know if you see it really well, she has red hair. And uh, basically for, from birth, it was, she was diagnosed as having um, a cortisol insufficiency and basically ACTH uh, uh, deficiency. Then, as we discuss, and you recognize it, her, you can recognize in on the chart, she has early onset morbid obesity and red, red hair and pale, pale skin. So, of course, uh, uh, she has a deficiency in the pro melanocortin, so POMC deficiency. And when she reached uh, 20, so her weight was 160 kilos and, and, and her body mass index was above 50. And she, she started developing um, complications with the sleep apnea, asthma, and it, it was even difficult for her to walk. So she had an handicap. And she started asking for bariatric surgery. And, and I was a little bit uh, in, 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 in difficulty here because uh, in our center, we, we had the experience of bariatric surgery in patients with the leptin receptor variants and, and others, and, and, and the results was not very good. So basically the experience we had was that this patient can actually um, lose weight, but, but a minimal amount of weight, and it's frequently followed by, by weight regain. But then uh, about the same time when she asked about bariatric surgery, we knew about development of new molecules, and especially um, a new uh, melanocortin for receptor agonist. And in the previous talks, you of course heard about the, the importance of this leptin receptor, leptin, leptin receptor melanocortin pathway, and, and basically to, to some extent, 
the use of uh, melanocortin for receptor agonists is kind of a chemical bypass of the system because, of course, you, you, you st stimulate uh, MC4R, which is so important in the decrease in food intake and increase in energy expenditure. And we knew also from previous studies that if you use the natural agonist, uh, basically uh, MSH for uh, MC4R, uh, and especially in uh, POMC deficient mice, uh, you can see a diminution in, in, in weight. And, and so, so then in, in mice with POMC deficiency, this agonist is uh, basically efficient in reducing weight. And uh, uh, there has been a conjunction of, uh, of time and of good time for, for, for this patient and also another one uh, uh, in Germany and especially uh, um, at, in Berlin, where uh, uh, basically a German patient was uh, also um, showed to have a, a, a POMC deficiency. So we had two patients and, and together with Peter Kunan, and it was at the initiation of uh, uh, Peter Kunan, the idea was to uh, test the hypothesis of the use of a, a new uh, MC4 uh, agonist called set melanotide that was um, to start to test that in those two patients. And uh, actually, um, so the patient one, as I told you, was from Germany, and the patient two is, is uh, uh, the profile of uh, this French patient I, I, I just showed you, and they started receiving set melanocyte. And it was amazing to see that rapidly after the, the initiation of treatment, and, and basically that's a daily subcutaneous injection of set melanocyte, you have a very rapid diminution of the hunger score. And, and I, I, you know, you use from 0 0.5 or 1 milligram set melanotide, and very rapidly, this patient described a, a major improvement of their hyperfunction. And this is also associated with, of course, a diminution of, of weight. And you can see in both patients the, the profile with the improvement of, of weight. Uh, after uh, 100 weeks here for the German patient and, and, and 50 weeks from, uh, for the, the, the French patient. So then in the first uh, period, after a bit more than four years, um, uh, her weight was, uh, as you can see here, uh, 84, 89 kilos. And, and just to remember, she, she, the maximum reach weight was 160 kilos. So basically, these two patients have now been treated for uh, seven years with set melanotide. And uh, uh, as you can see here, and this is not published yet, um, the, the effect is, is, is persisting. So th there is um, uh, the hunger the score. They, they really have a, a benefit on hyperphagia. And, and the weight uh, has stabilized now. And, and basically, for the French patient, she has uh, she, she basically lost half of her weight because her weight is now uh, 80 kilos. And of course, she has ma major improvement in her uh, quality of, of life. And, and it's quite clear, she completely changed life. And, and in addition to that, uh, th they had, of course, improvement of their metabolic condition. So then one of the questions also, which is um, very important, is that in the first uh, uh, period uh, with the generation of new melanocortin for um, receptor agonists, there was adverse effect, and especially adverse effect uh, regarding blood pressure and heart rate. So it was absolutely key to, to of course, uh, uh, look at uh, the, the change of uh, blood pressure and heart rate in this patient. But with the use of this uh, um, molecule set melanotide, as you can see here, they, they did not increase their blood pressure. Basically, they have improvement of their blood pressure and a diminution of heart rate. So there was no a cardiovascular adverse event, event in, in those cases. The main adverse effect is about pigmentation. And the reason for, for that is, is that a set melanotide is not only an agonist for the melanocortin for receptor, but is also an agonist for the melanocortin one receptor, which is on the skin and basically uh, uh, is involved in pigmentation. And, and you can see that uh, that's something uh, quite in, in important because, uh, of course, we had uh, we have a follow-up of of the skin with with increased tanning, 
and also we can see a change in her uh, color. So then uh, it seems that we can say now to some extent that we are uh, kind of going to uh, towards a precision approach in monogenic form of obesity. And we, we've seen in the previous talk that uh, indeed, if you have variant uh, in, of course, leptin, leptin receptor and, and, and genes downstream the leptin receptor, you, you develop a severe monogenic form of obesity, so early onset obesity and, and, and hyperphagia. And it's also true for other genes that can uh, be involved in the regulation of the melanocortin pathway. So what do we have learned here? So we knew already, of course, for some years, is that when uh, these uh, children you can see here are deficient for leptin, you can use uh, leptin as a drug, which improve indeed um, uh, uh, weight and, and induce weight loss in leptin deficient children. And that's a, a fantastic work from Sadaf Farouki in Cambridge. And so it's true in children and it's true also in, in adults. And, and again, that's a very famous paper where uh, if you use leptin in adults, um, and, and you can see here, this uh, was published some years ago, where uh, after 18 months uh, leptin injection, you have major modification of weight. Here it's uh, weight loss. So you can see more than uh, 76, uh, 47 here, 60 uh, kilos after uh, 18 months um, leptin. And, and in, in this case also, it was uh, clearly described hormonal improvement. But of course, uh, leptin cannot be used when uh, people have, have mutation, uh, of course, in leptin receptor and, and, and also uh, downstream the leptin receptor. And, and then uh, this is again <laughs> some uh, um, historic uh, description where we, we showed uh, more than 20 years ago now, uh, we described the, the, the first family with the leptin receptor deficiency. And again, you can see here the rapid increase in weight and hyperphagia together with the hypogonadism, delayed puberty, and in that case, in those cases, growth retardation. So then the, the, the question immediately came, uh, which immediately came was, can we use uh, uh, MC4 agonist in this patient with a leptin receptor deficiency? So then in the first uh, three cases, we, we describe, uh, as you can see here, just for to remind you, uh, on the upper part here, you have POMC deficient patient. Uh, then here on, on, the, on the right panel, you have the use in, of set melanotide in DBDB mouse, which are animals uh, genetically deficient in the leptin receptor. And here in the three panels here, you can see uh, the, the treatment in patient with a leptin receptor uh, variants. And again, um, on the dashed line, you see the reduction in the hunger score. So this is efficient for hunger and the diminution in, in, in weight again. And, and you see here is that when you interrupt the drug, and you can see that in green for a patient with leptin receptor variant, or here, for the patient with POMC deficient variants, when you have an interruption of the uh, of set melanotide, the, the patient starts having again hyperphagia and, and the weight rebound. So all that was kind of the background for a phase three trials. Uh, of course, in, in, in this case of rare uh, uh, monogenic form of obesity. So with colleagues in, in Europe, you, you can see here uh, the names. Uh, the, the idea was then to do a phase three trial where you can see the design here. So, to, so the first phase was to titrate um, the, the set melanotide, so having an effect on both uh, reduction of, of hunger and, and weight loss. Then an up -up label phase, then a withdrawal sequence, and then again, the drug again is an opal uh, label uh, treatment phase, and, 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 and this was uh, for uh, a year. And the primary endpoint in that case was the proportion of, of patients who actually achieve more than 10% weight loss. So, and, and we had the opportunity because of this, uh, especially European consortium, we had the opportunity to test 
10 patients with pump C deficiency and 11 patients with leptin receptor deficiency. So as you can see on the table, they were quite young. So between 18 to uh, 24 uh, year, years old as, as a mean, uh, it was quite balanced for uh, gender, um, ethnicity, and you can see here a body mass index. So, so again, we, we are speaking of, of, of severe to morbid form of obesity. And, and you can see with the, with the scale, the hunger score were, were, were high, eight for a top of, of 10. So when we, we look at the, the weight loss, uh, again, we, we, we observe what we've seen before in, in more limited cases. You can see the decrease in, in body weight in POMC deficient patient, as well as in patient with a leptin receptor uh, variant. I, I, I'll bite it was uh, less, to some extent, less impressive for LEPAR. But what clearly the patient uh, um, uh, said is, is it, was, it was this major improvement in the hunger score. And, and again, you can see here for POMC deficient patients, a reduction of the, the hunger uh, score. And, and, and it was even more for a patient with leptin receptor uh, variant. And, and what you can see here is it, you see uh, uh, it's increasing again um, uh, for some time. And this corresponds to uh, the withdrawal uh, sequence, where again, you stop the drug. Basically, you have uh, a new uh, feeling of, uh, of uh, hunger. So uh, just a, a little summary for this uh, placebo sequence. Uh, clearly, it has been associated for both LEPAR and POMC deficiencies in increased weight, as well as increased hunger score. So then the question is about uh, adverse effect. So I told you already about uh, cardiovascular effect. And it was, as I said, very important to show that there was no effect on increased blood pressure or increased heart rate. But um, what are the, the common adverse effects is mostly um, injection site reaction, skin hyperpigmentation, and I spoke about that. That's most uh, nearly, uh, so more, more than 80% of the patient. Some adverse effect on, ad, especially at the treatment initiation uh, regarding nausea and vomiting, as well as disturbance in sexual arousal. And, and what you can see here, which is also very important and, and, and that we, we can see in, in, in every patient, most of the adverse effect can be seen at the initiation of, of the treatment. So after three, four weeks, they are going better. But, but uh, um, the first three, three, four weeks for some patients, not all can be difficult, especially with a gastrointestinal uh, effect. So then in summary for the set melanotide uh, trial. So as I told you, we, we had about uh, more than 20 uh, patients, either POMC or LEPAR uh, mutation. Of course, uh, they achieve uh, the, the as a mean, the, the, the primary uh, outcome. We, have, we had more weight loss in POMC deficient patients than in LEPAR, but, but they had major improvement. The hunger score diminished a lot no cardiovascular effect, increased fragmentation with adverse effect improving this time. And what was also very important, and, and we had the opportunity to test uh, some quality of life uh, using some quality of life questionnaires. And, and clearly there was a, a, an improvement of quality of life outcomes in this, in this patient. So now what are the perspectives? So, so we heard about a uh, syndromic form of, of obesity and, and especially uh, also bardet beadle syndromes. And, and we learn from uh, fundamental studies that actually some of the genes uh, can be regulator of the melanocortin system. So to some extent, patient with bardet beadle can be candidate to test uh, melanocortin for agonist molecules. And then there has been uh, other variants in genes, in genes regulating the leptin melanocortin pathway. And, and, and there, there are, it will be important to, 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 to identify which uh, of these patients can be responsive to this type of drugs. 
And just to, to show you uh, um, a first uh, study that has been uh, published uh, uh, some time ago, where in Barded Beedle, there was uh, uh, indeed an effect with, with uh, um, uh, about uh, uh, a bit more than 15% weight loss uh, in patients with, with Barded Beedles. And it appears that indeed, in, in the case of Barded Beedle uh, syndrome, some patients can be responsive to, to, to the drugs. And, and others are less responsive to the drug. So this raises us to um, what we've heard also before. So, so we've heard that uh, we can diagnose this form of genetic of, of obesity and probably it's also underdiagnosed. And just to share our experience, what, what we are doing in our country in France is that we have a, a several, um, we have a network uh, basically for severe obesity uh, management with uh, 37 centers on the French uh, national territory. And, and we have a, 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 a network of groups and it's called FORCE where uh, we try to uh, harmonize practices and, and, and also perform a clinical in investigation. And thanks to these networks, we were uh, able to disseminate a web tool for diagnosis uh, of uh, genetic obesity. So basically, uh, um, medical doctors uh, and, and in these centers or also in other centers can use this uh, uh, web tool and enter uh, the clinical um, uh, uh, phenotype of the patient, and we can orient the diagnosis and also orient where the, the, the genetic aspect can be, can be screened. And, and, and I think it, it's, it's very important here, it's in, in the national level, but probably in the future, it will be absolutely key to uh, probably develop that uh, at the international uh, level, because now, we have the possibility for uh, to, to target this patient and, and for the, to at least to test this uh, new molecule. Okay, I'm going to stop here and, of course, uh, thanking the, the, the different colleagues and especially in the clinical ne networks I, I, I talked about, the different colleagues in, in, in Europe in the, involved in, in, in treating this uh, patient with genetic form of obesity. And my very close colleague, uh, Christine Poitou and Be Beatrice Dubern. Christine is, is working on this, this uh, special center for uh, obesity management um, and especially, you know, patient with genetic form of obesity and Beatrice for uh, the pediatric form uh, in, in, in those cases. So I'm going to stop here. I'd be happy to take questions um, on this uh, topic. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Karine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, do we have any questions at all from anybody? Um, we had one from, um, well, from, from you and before, um, which was obviously the le about the level of underdiagnosis and how um, you speakers maybe think we can reach people and obviously the healthcare professionals as well. There's a bit of a theme coming through with these webinars at the moment about, um, you know, getting to the people that need us, really. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. I guess, yeah, I agree with, with regarding underdiagnosis. Um, when, when, you know, we, we speak with these colleagues, um, uh, it, it's really specialists, uh, basically, who, who know, uh, they know about these syndromes and, and, and so on. And I agree with what has been said before, what Erika has said before. It, I, I think it's really under under diagnosis, diagnosed. And, and if we, for example, for some years ago, we, we did a screening for, for lepar, leptin receptor variant in, in a large cohort. It, it was something, it was more than uh, 500 uh, uh, subjects at, at first. And, and we realized that uh, patient with uh, leptin receptor mutation, it was uh, nearly 5% of the, of the group. And then we, we yeah, it, so, so if we focus on a population with really in, rapid increase in, in weight from birth, plus as we heard, we've heard uh, hyperphagia, we are going to find uh, not only uh, variant in genes, I mean, common genes, I would say, in the, in the LEPAR, POMC, uh, PCSK1, MC4, but probably also in regulatory genes, and, and there are many others. So. Katie, may I add to that uh, answer? Because as I saw the question, it is also the question, how do they 
how, how do we get them to our centers? Mm -hmm. And if that is one of the questions, we, we also notice that it's very important to, first of all, put it into the guidelines and, and your uh, a clinical consensus uh, uh, statements, etc. And second of all, uh, a lot of healthcare professionals working in obesity still need uh, to be edu educated and trained on this specific, on the diagnostic of this. And, and I'm sure uh, Kareem does the same. And in our country, Lisbeth and I and many other people already give a lot of trainings specifically on this. And then you notice that people start to refer. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. And, and we had uh, actually last year an, an initiative um, uh, in, in France, uh, where uh, we, we, and it was uh, coordinated by Christine Poitou, where uh, we had a specific um, uh, report on, on, on management, obesity management, especially in those uh, genetic forms of obesity. And, and uh, yeah, so, and then it, it was, um, so this report was disseminated by the health um, authorities uh, uh, in France. And, and yes, we realized that, you know, education in, in, uh, in physician is, is so important because, you know, this syndrome was looked at being ultra, ultra rare. And, and, and you know, many, ex you know, people who are not specialists just, don't know about about the, the syndrome and and now we have the opportunity to have specific treatment so so this needs to to stimulate the the, the genetic diagnosis yes if i may add to that i completely agree with Karine and also erica to to more train the healthcare professionals i think also with the yeah, so we made also with the wonka for the european gps a, a, a webinar about all kinds of underlying causes because genetic obesity is one of it but you also have endocrine causes medication causes hypothalamic causes but uh, genetic is, is fully in there uh, but another point is also to educate uh, the, the broad audience and that helps me know to see in the Netherlands, for example, that we wrote together a, a, a book, a Fat the Secret Organ. It's in 11 languages in the meantime right now. And two of the chapters are stories of uh, patients with obesity, uh, genetic obesity, because we described the whole appetite regulation system, because also in, in other forms, it's also important for, for the broad audience. And also the story of, of uh, Erica's patient is in there with, with the MC4 receptor defect and the leptin. And, and the funny thing is that people start to recognize their own stories or tell about it to their neighbors about it. They go to their GP, the GP don't know about it. But then we have those webinars also for, for the national GPs or other medical specialists, and they get informed. Um, and, and, and also the guidelines, of course, very, very important in this field. Um, but then if people are, are uh, weaponed themselves with knowledge, they start to, to, to read about it and to ask for it. And that also helps. So healthcare professionals on the one hand, but broad communication. So it would also be beneficial in all your countries, I think, talk about it. And also television influencers show that there's more types of obesity than, than people start recognizing themselves. Mm -hmm. Lots to be done. Um, so we have another question in the chat from Arena. I don't know which um, speaker would like to take that, but she's asking um, about um, in a paediatric endocrine clinic, they're faced with um, infants with weight issues. Um, do you wait to screen? Um... So uh, do I understand the question right? That in a paediatric uh, clinic, if you have patients under treatment for endocrine disorders, whether you want to look into obesity disorders? Yeah, so it says in pediatric endocrine clinic, we may be faced with infants with weight issues. Do you wait to genetic screen the infants that present with increased weight until after 12 to 18 months, as some of them might sort of grow out of it, especially at 12 ah. months of age? Okay. Yeah, so the timing of when when will you start doing the diagnostics? Well, of course, it depends, as, especially on the clinical picture and how specific it is. Eh? If the weight increase is immense and, and nothing helps eh? and, and everybody already tries to do lifestyle, etc., and it doesn't help, then then you, you I, we, we already can do it. Uh, 
Under the age of one, yes, certainly, because uh, the earlier you diagnose, the better you can treat. So that, that's important. But on the other hand, I can also know uh, patients that, that in the first year of life have a terrible weight curve, and then you first need to do, uh, uh, yeah, support them and coach them, et cetera. And then uh, suddenly when they start walking, it gets better. You also have those, of course, they're in there. I mean, Elizabeth touched on the sort of the stigma around this. How, how is that, how is it, you know, when you have a patient that comes in with a, with a sort of an infant that young, how, how do they often respond to such a sort of diagnosis if you do test them? Well, I heard, I hear a lot of in, in the adults uh, that, that also other colleagues are reacting, well, you maybe you shouldn't test because they sort of have uh, feel free to eat a lot because they have a disease. But in in adults, at least, I see the other way around. They they um, I, I mean obesity by itself, of course, is a disease. But the monogenic obesity is even more considered by the by their 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 environment as a disease, and they get more support, uh, and and that already helps them to 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 feel better mentally, uh, to to be supported in your lifestyle, and not be exposed to too much food all the time, and and so so. I, I see the expectations are different of colleagues I, and it, it's not that if you test it that people feel free oh now I can eat everything I want no we, we, they, they now they understand their body and they know why they have to to work so much more and to put so much more effort in losing weight than any other person so I, I, I'm not sure whether it's the same for the pediatric endocrinologists in Korea oh. Well, I often have patients who start crying when they hear the diagnosis. They, they, it has been a terrible uh, time before that. And now finally they understand what's happening with them. And so they find that very uh, yeah, emotional often. And then still, as we, you, you, you cannot say, oh, I have this disease. I don't need to do anything anymore. No, I, we always say you need to work 10 times as hard as anybody else to yeah. And 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 if the, and then but now there is more uh, specific support and pharmacotherapy, so that very important well, for them. Ready? Yeah, if I may, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, uh, for most of the patient with the diagnosis, in my experience, it was a relief, and and really, uh, and, and you know, I'm mostly seeing adults, and and so. Uh, but really having, and, and I just have in mind some people where actually we made a diagnosis like above the age of 40. <laughs> and, and it was it was really a relief to know that th there is something in, in their biology uh, that, and, and then it's even more, as, as you said, uh, both of you, uh, Elizabeth and, 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 and Erika, if we have now new uh, uh, treatment opportunities. It's not, I mean, we know that with these new treatment of opportunities, it, it, it doesn't solve obviously all the problems. And, 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 and in the management, um, we still need to, to have, uh, of course, uh, uh, lifestyle uh, action, uh, psychological aspects. We, we spoke about stigma. I mean, these children, they are suffering uh, during, uh, at school and, and for stigmatization and even in the medical sector, it's difficult for, for them. So, so it's, it's a, a really multifaceted uh, approach to treat this patient. Yes, and I, I, I totally agree because what we also have to, to realize that even in a person with genetic obesity, also other factors can contribute to the obesity. So like the case I showed with the 16P deletion syndrome, well, there was a psychosis. He was way more weight gaining uh, when he was using antipsychotic medication. He had autism and he was not so, so comfortable in, in social environment and doing exercise. Um, there's so many other causes in top of their genetic uh, um, uh, um, uh, vulnerability. Uh, and, and that's also what we always do. So in our center, we look at the patient with obesity with all the aspect. And actually we also made a tool we nationally, we use in our in a digital tool, the obesity care tool to detect all these kinds of uh, uh, causes. Is it lifestyle, is it medication, uh, hormonal, or are there alarm symptoms to think of genetic obesity? And often it's a it's a package, it's it's a combination, and and also this combination can help against the stigma that also the okay the antipsychotic medication also uh, counteracts the weight loss, for example. So I absolutely agree with Karine just said. Yeah. 
I imagine the patient gaining that information helps them to understand it and then the understanding helps the acceptance and then the case of making a you know a clinical pathway going forward um one thing that I wonder is if you have patients that come into clinic who themselves believe there is something in their genetics and maybe the testing proves that that isn't how they sort of respond to that news um now we know it's completely multifactorial but i'd just be interested if you have any cases where you know the results were expected to be positive and maybe they weren't and how that sort of panned out yeah, yeah maybe i can start i mean it, it it's it's really what the question you raised is is about the genetic screening so, so what do we do which panel of genes uh what are we which cost uh, uh, are the patient is going to be reimbursed for the so this raised many questions so so what I can tell is, is, is in our um, center for example we were for many years we were kind of uh, you know stuck to some genes uh, mostly the main genes in 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 the um, you know leptin lept, leptin receptor PMC PCSK1 MC4 but then now with, with the new technological development and the possibility to screen more genes, so it's changing. So uh, maybe, I mean, some of the patients, so, so one, one aspect of the discussion is, okay, we haven't, we did not find, you know, variant in those genes, but it can be others. And, and especially if the, if the clinical history is, is there and, and as, as it was said also before, the, the, the history of, the, of obesity in the family is also very important. Maybe we, we can think of, of going further for the genetic screening. And then at the end of the day, maybe we, we, we are not going to find a variance, and, and, but we can explain it could be ge genetic, but with our current knowledge, for now, we, we, we don't know, but, but I guess what has been said before with the different now option for pharmacological therapies, it could be important uh, in, in maybe in the, in the future to have kind of a panel of drugs to, to test. And, and we need to find, you know, that's really what is per precision is about uh, in, in, in this field. Yeah, so maybe also the expectations in advance. I recognize this. This is very often the situation that you have a high suspicion, but you don't find the exact gene mutation. But still, if a very suspicious patient uh, with very high uh, all the alarm symptoms, early onset obesity, autism, uh, hyperphagia, only one in the family, very typical case. I still call it a clinical picture of, uh, of, of genetic obesity. And sometimes it even works to, to ask for reimbursement to get pharmacotherapy reimbursed for this rare clinical picture. Like we do it also for lipodystrophy, for example, we often don't have to, the, the gene, but you still have the clinical phenotype of lipodystrophy. And in the same time, I think if you have, sometimes you're in the gray area, then it's difficult. And, and we also know it's not always monogenic. It's sometimes a combination of, we know very polygenetic obesity, some forms, if you have strong combination of polygenetic obesity, it can be the same picture as monogenetic obesity. There are new insights, new developments around that. And also the epigenetics can be present. Um, so sometimes with our techniques, we don't find it, but doesn't necessarily mean it's not a genetic obesity. It can still be a genetic obesity. So making a clinical diagnose, and sometimes three years later, we do have the, the diagnosis. So expectation management, that, that's what I learned from those trajectories, not to create any disappointment, but, but do only proper diagnostics if you have a true suspicion. Further comments from the speakers or any further questions before we close this afternoon? I can't see anything in the chat at the moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. No? <laughs> Shall I take that? I'll take the silence as a no. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd just like to thank again, um, Corrine, Elizabeth and Erica, it's fantastic presentations. Um, the session has been recorded, which um, I will share on the SharePoint and via the email um, that you registered with um, later in the week. And um, the speakers have also given me some publications that would probably be of interest to share. So I'll pop those on the email as well. 
Um, yeah, so I think we'll just say thank you very much. And the next webinar is on the 31st of May, and we will be looking at regulation of energy balance and body weight. Um, and Dr. Giles Yeo is one of the confirmed speakers for that. So I'm sure that'll be very interesting. Um, and yeah, good evening um, to all. And thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you.